Hi, I'm Zach Waters, and welcome to another episode of What The Gaff Stop Photo Talk, where I chat to photographers about their life and connection to the world through photography. Today's podcast is with editorial photographer Richard Baker. Some of you may know his name through his work with the Red Arrows, which we talk about in depth with our chat. So I ran to the Louvre. We know the the triangular, the pyramid-shaped dome there. Yeah. And I realised that there could be a picture in there because otherwise there ain't no picture. I've come all this way. They're going to fly over. Yeah. That's it. That's all I'm going to get. If I miss it and I'm winding on, frame by frame by frame like, there's no old, there's no motor drive here there's no 20 frames per second yeah it's frame by frame by frame i'm gonna miss it and sure enough i realized that they're due and i make a phone call i make one phone call to red 10 he's the ground operations man he's the man in the red suit who stands there with a microphone on the seafront yeah. and says ladies and gentlemen get your cameras out ready for the red arrows and here they come and they're in such and such a formation and next they're going to do that and then they're going to be in that or another and then they're going to fly past and it's been lovely having him. he is he's standing as i as i ring him on the top of the arc de triomphe and he's standing wow. next to french generals and i phone him and say steve steve when are they due i'm by, i'm in position <laughs> and he goes do not talk to me i am talking to the team i'm talking to these generals but they're due in 30 seconds. Following his Red Arrows book, he's worked on a number of other books, The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work, Religion for Atheists, both published by Hamish Halmerton, A Week at the Airport, a Heathrow Diary, published by Profile, in collaboration with Alain de Botton. And then he worked alongside author Polly Morland on a couple of projects. One was RiskWise, Nine Everyday Adventures, and that was published by Profile. And then a book we went into in depth was A Fortunate Woman, A Country Doctor Story. And when Polly, the writer, says to the doctor, I don't suppose you've heard of a book by John Berger that was about a country doctor in 1967. And the doctor says, it's why I became a doctor. I know that book. And I've read it four times. Wow. Once, twice, two, three times when I was a teenager, when I was 14. Wow. Once when I finally thought I might want to study medicine. And then by accident, she then discovers after she's become a doctor and she's accepted a new post in a country practice, she then realizes that the book is in exactly the same practice, the same landscape as she's been into. Wow. That's when you think yeah. the threads are all, the, the, the stars are aligning here. The stars say this was meant yeah, to be. Totally. That's when you realize you've got something special on your hands. We discussed a lot of things in our chat. You better be prepared. It's a two hour chat. And so get your cup of tea, get your slippers on, get on a good comfy chair. Um, it's really in depth. We covered his early days at Southend Airport and went back before that and went to his time living in Belgium with his family. We also looked at his passion to travel. That was coming out before he could make head nor tail of what being a professional photographer was. So we looked at the next step, which was his time at Newport under David Hearn. But I went to Southend Library, asked the librarian, did she know of any photography courses? I remember this very clearly. She poked in a box and she pulled out a prospectus. And it was, she said, it's in Wales, South Wales in Newport. And I said, oh, I have no idea where that is. It doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> I opened it up and it was a kind of concertina pullout. And there were pictures by a man called Roger Hutchings in there. And his pictures were of a protest that he'd shot for the Telegraph. And it was probably of a policeman battering a protester over the head with a, with a truncheon. It was something like yeah. that. It was the most extraordinary news picture. And I just thought, an Astral Geographic? Nah. I want to be Roger Hutchings. I want to go to Newport. And I applied. I was 24. And I spent two years in Newport under the tutelage of David Hearn and Daniel Meadows and Clive Landon. Uh, it was just the most magical time. And I hark back to the first day. We chatted about a great deal of stuff. But what was become really apparent when we chatted was that we were working in the same area, we knew the same people, we frequented the same buildings, the same pub, the same camera hire places, kit hire places, processing labs, but we never met. We never directly met. Maybe we did indirectly. But it's amazing just listening to somebody's experience, which I can totally relate to, and take something from and sort of have the same feelings as he has. 
about that time and that period and what it took to be a photographer at that period in the 90s and the zeros. So I hope somebody listening to this can also get that feeling or just get a sample and a feel of what it's like to be a professional photographer working in a professional market which needed 120% commitment. It was demanding. Sometimes there was not a lot of return but there was definitely a lot of expectation. So I was delighted when he said oh yeah come on let's have a chat. So the day came and I give him a shout and I asked him what he was up to. I'm taking a rest actually this week. The week before I was at the Farmer Air Show, it was the hottest day. And uh, of course, ironically, the hottest day at an air show, you know, seemed to be um, quite an interesting occasion. Uh, So I really pushed it. I'm no spring chicken anymore, but I made sure that I was there photographing basically what I want. I mean, no one pays me to go to these things. And I got a press pass, been going since 1989. And I thought, well, I will explore the world of aviation as it comes around every two years. Of course, this time it was every four years. So there was a lot of things to photograph. Um, It's quite low key this year, but I really put a lot of energy into it. And then at the weekend when it was all over and then this week really felt it. So I think the heat and the footfall that I was putting in at Farnborough really uh, uh, paid its toll. So I have been out this week. Um, I mean, I try and get out every week, uh, every day. I... uh, I do see it as part of my role to uh, to keep going, to to be out there photographing whatever interests me, really. And again, no one pays me to do this. I do it from my own uh, passion and my own motivation to to see what's out there, to explore and to, to pace the streets and decide what I'm going to do day by day. So I have been out this week, but I've been reining it in a bit. Just done my park run, my 5K in a local park. So I feel quite wound down now, fairly... Um, fairly relaxed and uh, happy to talk about whatever you want you talk about. What is it with photographers in park runs? <laughs> do many do it? I'm the only one I thought was doing them. I tell you what it is with me. I tell you what, when I got to 50, I'm 62 now. When I got to 50, I realized I was slowing down. My fitness was dropping off. My stamina wasn't there anymore. And although when you've been putting in the miles over the years and the decades, you can't keep it up as, as one did. I mean, in the old days when I was doing magazine assignments and going away and doing big stories for days and, and weeks at a time, I was putting on a lot of lot of effort and, and I could do it in those days. Nowadays, I can't. So I got to the age of 50 and I started doing little laps around our park just outside here and found that it was coming back. My fitness was not dropping off so quickly. And so the last 10, 12, well, actually 12 years now, I've been running just distances that, that suited me. And then I started doing the odd half marathon and got a bit fed up with those and realized I couldn't do that. On a, on a morning and then go out and go and shoot pictures on the street during the uh, the rest of the day or the week. So I'm not doing those distances anymore. So 5K on a Saturday morning and maybe one midweek really suits me. It's just the kind of distance I need to keep my stamina up. And, and also, actually, it's about mental health as well. I mean, I don't suffer from poor mental health, but it does, it does pep me up. Sitting here now talking to you, I feel really calm quite relaxed, not tired at the moment. So yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know other photographers that do park runs. Are there many? Tom Broadbent does them. Who else? I've seen other photographers with Tom's talking to other people who are on park runs. And I'm like, oh, okay. Don't you get enough cardio with your photography? You're always stumping the streets. Actually, no. I don't think it is about cardio. I mean, unless I'm running up and down steps and escalators. I think it's fairly even, actually. When I do go out... I I kind of hit the street running, really, or at least I try to. I, I leave the house. Here's a, here's a typical day. I do a bit of admin in the morning. I, I might have done some stretches to get my body going again <laughs> because I'm stiffening up. I go out and I don't have any predisposition about where I want to be and what I want to do. I'd look at the weather and I decide where I'm going to go from what I see outside my window because I can see the city beyond and see what's going to roll in. Maybe there's some heavy rain or it's some storm. I decide on the spur of the moment. It's all governed by weather and my own sense of purpose that day. So whether I get on a bus, get on a train, walk out from the front door and keep on going on foot, I don't know. It's, it's, it's completely spontaneous. And, and this is largely when there is nothing happening in the news. Now, if there is something happening in the news, let's say I've picked up on something on the on a BBC or I've had an alert or something, that's when I'll become more interested and, and I'll hone in to a place 
whether it's Westminster or it's the city or West End or even in this area here, I will uh, decide on the spur of the moment what I'm going to do based on that kind of information. So Acts of God, yeah. Yeah, acts of God. Yeah. Is, is there going to be a storm coming? Is it going to be the hottest day of the year? Is it going to be storm whatever it is, storm Denise or storm Dorothy? Is, is that going to be the, the talking point of the day? Can I make some pictures out of it? Will I be able to upload them with some sense of topicality by the end of the day? Will they sell overnight? That kind of thing. Well, it goes back to my opening statement why I'm sort of very intrigued by you. And that's very obvious on your website, what you're doing. I'm fascinated by the fact that you're just out there creating content to get in the mainstream of picture sales and stuff like that. And I find that really interesting. It's very obvious on your website, that's what you're doing, because you do it through Photo Shelter, don't you? I do. So I don't have a, a website per se. I mean, I, I used to in the early days that I used to build myself absolutely hopeless at it. It looked awful. And there was a point yeah. some years ago when I thought, well, I'm running an archive from Photo Shelter. I'm just going to transfer my domain name over. Yeah. And that's become my website, which of course is a selling uh, shop. It's a shop window for everything I do. Everything I've shot f- of purpose in the last 30 something years is is up there. At least the best stuff is. And, and, and I guess if you've been through it, um, Zach, you'll see there's a lot. There's, there's a lot. There's, there's actually too much. I mean, I keep running out of storage space. I have to keep buying storage space and deleting substandard work that I that I don't have any feelings for. So it's a constant process of uh, when you say generating content. I mean, I I love taking pictures in the way that I did on my very first day of uh, of college, um, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. Yeah. I have to do it. It's intoxicating. I, I find it. I find it compulsive. I find it needy. I find it. You know, it, it's an obsession that that has never left me. And I know a lot of people out there who have been photographing for many years have said, you know, they keep saying to me, "God, you know, how do you keep doing it? It's always a grind. You know, I don't sell anything. What I do sell is not worth a jot." No. I don't worry about what it's going to earn. I just have to go and make the work and see it and edit it and be pleased at the end of the day that I've done my best and I've got something worthwhile. And if I'm really pleased with it, I'll drag it into my best of gallery and, and go from there yeah. and, and see if I get any reaction. I mean, I, you know, I use social media a lot. I used Instagram and I, and I like Twitter better, actually. And I like to see what people like. And then I check on my sales overnight or subsequent nights and I see what sells. And that spurs me on to I don't feel as if I'm a machine. I I I I, I do put some emotion into this, and 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 sometimes it doesn't suit me, um, Zach. Sometimes yeah. I don't want to go out for whatever reason, and I'll sit here and tinker, and it gives me some strength for the next day, and I'll I'll hit the pavement the next day. So you're putting stuff out on your Fort Shelter site, Alamy, Getty. Or are you putting into all three at the same time, or are you just sort of maneuvering about? Uh, yes, manoeuvring is good. Good idea. Yes. Um, so everything that uh, is good is good enough. Good enough to sell. Good enough to see. Good enough to view. Goes on my photo shelter site. Yeah. Really trying hard to to cut what quantities I put up there because, as I said, I'm running out of storage. The very best uh, goes to Getty, and I have an arrangement with a, a lovely um, fella called Mike Kemp, who runs a little agency, uh, a group of photographers called In Pictures. Mike and I have known each other for donkey's years. It was the first person I, who, who phoned me back and who I contacted after the agency days when I had a, a project about the Red Arrows to, um, to flog. IPG. Yeah, after, after that, immediately after that. And, and we've known each other since then. He, he acts as my portal, my editor, and he takes uh, roughly three quarters or two thirds of what I give him. The rest I give to Alamy. Uh, so there's there's an overlap, you know. I'm I'm kind of a, a, a kind of commercial Venn diagram where it's 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 proportioned out. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find this way works then in terms of revenue sales? Do you actually attract other clients coming in and say, "Can you cover this for me? Can you cover that? How does that work with you?" No, no one phones me anymore, and I don't mind that. And and to be honest, if they have, I found a way of maneuvering my way out of fulfilling what they might be asking me to do. I prefer to be autonomous and I prefer to be completely um, 
liberated, free from from those constraints. Now, yeah. of course, I'm going to lose money that way because you know I'm not being guaranteed a day rate, and I'm not being fed yeah. by what might be offered as a as a commission or as an assignment. That said, I do have a couple of regular clients. One's a corporate client. One's a a French company that puts ads on the back of buses. And as a result of what I put up on Photo Shelter, um, one of their creatives down in, in Lyon contacted me a few years ago and said, oh, we've got, we've got a new campaign and our bus travels around London. You know, I've seen the backs of some of the pictures that you've shot, Perfect. which are kind of contextual travel pictures, actually. Amazing ads on the back of buses that I did a little mini project about once. He saw those and he said, Go out for us. We'll have lots of them because we do this two or three times a year. It's just in London, new market for us. And I've been doing them ever since. And I chase after this bus. And Perfect. So, so there, there are occasions when I've attracted a, a new client or a buyer, but I don't court people. I, I don't chase. Yeah. I just go out and do what I want to do. When you say, you know, is, is it an, an attractive financial proposi- proposition? Absolutely not. Yeah. I couldn't be doing this if I was just starting out. I, I can only afford to do this because I have a, an archive and I can rely on print sales occasionally and the odd sale that comes through my site, but also from my Getty income. It doesn't make any financial sense. You know, I, I, I'm not, no. I, I'm counterintuitive to my, to my own business practice. I don't understand myself. I don't know how I do it. But I just carry on, Zach, and it and it's mm. not what young people or young students uh, and people starting out there or people wanting to maybe bend themselves in maybe my direction should be hearing. It's it's not it's not a good way to make a living. It's not healthy. <laughs> but as I've just said to you, I I have to do it. I don't know how many years I've got left doing this. If I can put one foot in front of another and be still standing at the end of the day and having shot. Uh, several hundred pictures a day. I'm very happy about that. And if people like them, people want to buy them, lovely. Well, you've answered my question. That's why I'm intrigued because I can see the way you're operating because I know your archive. I know your sort of history to a certain extent. What interested me about your website was that you don't really celebrate your past work directly. You're very what you're doing now work. And I find that quite interesting. And that's when I was like, mm-hmm. guys, this is an intriguing way to do it. So let's look at that. It doesn't seem like 2004 since the Red Arrow book came out. It's not scary. Mm. Yeah, 18 years ago I did that. And then it feels it, – it actually feels like a long, long time ago. I was a completely yeah. different person photographer then. So to paint a picture about that one project, can I give you a bit of insight? Are you ready for the insight for that? Pro- for the Red Arrows? Mm. No. No. <laughs> because okay. what I want to do, I want to get into that. Tell me about the Country Doctor shoot. When we think of Country Doctor, we go back to W. G. Eugene Smith, was his sort of 50s portrait of the American Country Doctor, but mm. – 1948, actually. Was it really? Mm. Oh, really? Mm. Anyway. Well, I thought, fifties. anyway, I love being corrected. <laughs> this new version is a sort of second part of the series in empowerment of women, really. The female doctor of the new century could, based on the Berger and the Jean Roy project of the country doctor in the 60s, wasn't it? So, yeah, in 1967, John Berger, who was living in a particular part of the borderlands between England and Wales, teamed up with a Swiss photographer called Jean Moore, yeah. and they were both bosom buddies anyway. They, they were great friends, and they struck up this working relationship and followed round a country doctor for six weeks and produced a book called A Fortunate Man, yeah. the story of a country doctor, uh, that was published and to great acclaim, it became a seminal work that photographers and writers celebrated because it, it was a great example of the photo book that was becoming very popular in the 60s. Yeah. Collaborations between artist, photographer, and writers. It also became a hugely successful book, yeah. and it still is, to working doctors and not just rural GPs, but general practice doctors anyway. Yeah. To cut a long story short, I was asked by a collaborator friend of mine called Polly Morland, who is a writer who has worked with me on a previous book, actually five years ago, on a book about risk takers, nine portraits of people who live in fairly risky environments. It was an okay book. It was a great thing to work on. We were well paid to do it. It was part financed by an insurance company. 
And we were put together by a writer called uh, Alain de Botton. I had a history, a collaborative history with him as well. Anyway, I was asked by Polly to, if I was interested in, in collaborating on this idea that she had had, where she had found this copy of Berger in her mother's house as she was clearing it out because her mother had um, dementia. She was going into a home. And Polly brought this, this book back and realized that she not only had never heard of this book. I mean, she was a big reader of John Berger anyway. She's a documentary writer and a journalist, a yeah. experience with TV and BBC. Not only had she not heard of it, but she was amazed that when she flicked through, she realized that she knew where a lot of these pictures were taken. She realized it was just at the bottom of her hill. She lived there. Yeah. And then she realized that this was a book about a country doctor. And she realized also that she knew the woman who was also a female GP in the same surgery. And she thought, hang on a minute, is there an idea here? And, and contacted me and said, if we put a pitch together, could I mention your name? Could you give me some reference pictures for the pitch? And I'll send it to my agent, which she did. And we, we put together a, a series of pictures from my archive. I mean, it, it, was, it was old old work from various magazine assignments and projects where I'd been involved with a country vet or yeah. I'd been into uh, a hospital for the anniversary of the NHS, that kind of thing. We put together this, this little, little pocket full of yeah. pictures that um, became the pitch that was a, like a 12-page treatment addressed to her agent the, who uh, punted it around some agencies, uh, some publishers. And before she knew it, there was a bidding war going on one Friday. And wow. she did a deal with um, Picador. It wasn't so much about the money, but it was about who yeah. would treat this story and this project with some respect. And she went with Picador, and um, we started almost immediately. And I, being in London, South London, I found myself journeying backwards and forwards through a kind of time portal into this valley, which in Berger's book yeah. is, is anonymized, as is the doctor. And we treated the landscape and the work of our doctor in the same way. Having said that, of course, it was during uh, this is this was uh, the latter part of 2020. So lockdowns and restrictions were yeah. made it really, really difficult for me to travel up and down. Now, of course, as a as a self employed freelance photographer, I had a reason to to go away from home to to not stay within these four walls, and I did so. But it involved crossing over uh, county lines, and of course. That meant that I had to be very careful which side of which county line I had to be in, yeah. according to which day the restriction applied to. Yeah. And it made it really tricky. It also gave me an opportunity to explore the landscape. And what we immediately identified was that there were no community events whatsoever in this in this little area. It's it, it's a it's, there's a river running through it. There's a valley, and there's two shoulders of land either side. There was nothing going on pretty much throughout the time that I was there photographing. And so we had to think of ways of suggesting through the pictures what was happening community-wise. Now, I figured out a way of contacting local businesses and making sure I could accompany them outside to do whatever they did, whether it was a tree surgeon or a man keeping bees, which of course is a, an ideal metaphor for the community you know, in the hive. Mm. We found ways of answering that. Alongside that, I spent some time with the uh, the woman GP in her surgery, inside her surgery room, as patients came in, fully PP'd up and asking them whether they mind being photographed and at the end, whether they mind signing a consent form. So every patient that I photographed or was identifiable was consented. And that was the arrangement between the doctor, especially the doctor because of patient confidentiality and the publisher and Polly, the writer. So we were all covered for permissions. There was no way that, as in Berger and Moore's time, virtually as, as we understood, nobody was consented. Nobody, in fact, there were people photographed in the surgery uh, in their time who even knew that the pictures were going to end up in a book and were rather flabbergasted when this book landed in the, in the local bookshop and, and they found themselves in it. So it was a completely di different way of working, as well as having to safeguard yeah. COVID restrictions with people who are obviously very vulnerable health-wise. So that was the, the background of it. I didn't spend that long time photographing with the camera to my eye, but she and I did a lot of background work figuring out how it was going to be illustrated, even before Polly sat down for the best part of 
several months to actually write the thing. She did know that even before she started writing, that the pictures wouldn't be so much illustrative. They would be little musical Mm. moments, little pauses for thought between passages of what she thought she was going to be writing. What she ended up with was, in fact, it was about this time last year that I I read her first draft and I realized for the first time actually how beautiful her writing was, how visual her passages were anyway. And she writes very visually as a, as a journalist, as a filmmaker. Yeah. She thinks and she writes in series of pictures. So even though I wasn't photographing alongside her words, her words became very part of what the pictures were trying to say and vice versa. So that if, for example, there is a passage about a patient who has taken their own life and the doctor has to deal with this quite a lot, and especially during a pandemic stage, there is a passage where she comes across someone who's taken their own life. And it's a really hard read, but to follow that up with an image was really tricky. And we had several ideas. I was showing her constantly what I was shooting all along. And there were low res going onto my photo shelter site. She had access to that. So she was drawing upon what I had photographed after each visit up there and then figuring out how she could write around these, um, these little ideas. So for example, this thing about the suicide, we came across one single frame. This is an example of how you know we might have found a way of, of finding a, a visual answer to her wonderful prose. And we found, uh, well, there were, two, there were two pictures. I said, I like the idea of a, of, a, of a detail of a puddle. And it was raining heavily. And so in the puddle, it's kind of grimy, it's dark, it's high contrast. There's circles from the rain, circles of confusion in, in the puddle. And I, I like that idea. And She said, yeah, that's great, but it could be a little bit seen as uh, as on the nose. It could be a bit too obvious. She said, I've just seen a picture of yours and it's one frame. And I don't know why there's only one frame. Usually I would shoot a sequence of of, of several. She said, I don't know why there's one picture, but it's of a chimney and there's some smoke curling up from the chimney. And in the background, you see the hill rise and there's a line of trees in the background. It's a a full bleed upright picture uh, that went in eventually. And actually... I saw it just as smoke curling, as something suggestive of community, of home. But actually, she saw in it something completely different. She said, no, that's Shakespearean because, uh, you know, in Macbeth, Macbeth talks about taking his own life and he talks about the candle burning bright and, you know, it's about snuffing out the candle. And so that really brought home to me just as that one example how we could be telling the story in a completely different way to the way Berger and Moore did so, where it was a lot more illustrative, where... They had access to the community, a lot more direct access to to patients because there was no pandemic in those days. So whereas we've treated their book uh, as a as a starting point, and we've used various um, points of reference in the way it's designed, the way the pictures work on certain pages, double pages with lovely pe- passages of writing over the I mean, double pages. It's a different piece of work completely. So if people are going to open it up and go, oh, well, that's not really Eugene Smith. It's not very John Berger and John Moore. It's for those reasons only that the rules were different. Our constraints were different. That's how we got round it. I was going to ask you that about the style of work you you were shooting for the book, because you're very quirky in a lot of ways with with your photography. Was this something you had to think about? Did you have an old school documentary head on in terms of your style of work when you were shooting this? This was something that was going on my head earlier before you brought all that out. A short answer is yes, I did have to think long and hard. Not only are they not quirky pictures, although we've put in a couple that you could be seen as slightly tongue in cheek to lift the mood slightly after maybe a difficult passage. There's a picture of um, some horses. uh, You know how you have um, stone gates? Well, there's two horses' heads on the gates, and above it says no horses. You know, it's a kind of quirky, and the posts are all leaning. There's a, everything slightly out of kilter. And we put that in, for example, to raise the mood and to, to make people a little bit smile before the next heavy passage about the next difficult job that the doctor came across. So there are pictures in that set and in the wider edit that didn't make it in. But largely, it became obvious that not only was this book about doctoring and patients and the community, but it was also about landscape because the patient and landscape are both secondary and third characters in the book. It's quite landscape heavy. So I'm not a landscape photographer and I have said this to Polly. I said, you know, I'll have a go and I'll enjoy having a go because I do love looking at landscapes. I, I revisited some old books on my shelf by Faye Godwin 
and James Revilius. And so I was drawing upon that work to maybe inject perhaps some quirkiness into the landscape. There's a picture also of, of a Land Rover that's half buried in the woods. Yeah. I have no idea how it got there. There's no sense of road or track. This car has been abandoned. It's overgrown and there's foliage growing across its bonnet. I have found the quirkiness of the landscape in some shapes and forms. Yeah. Otherwise, I've tried to make them beautiful. And not only that, because they're in black and white. And as, as you know, looking at the website, yeah. the only black and white I've got in there are two or three projects that go back 30 years or so ago. Yeah. I found it a beautiful challenge to, to get to grips with. And I'm, I don't have any regrets because we wanted the pictures to echo Jean Moore's in the Berger book, which are in black and white. And there is no way it could yeah. have been a color book. And the book's title is A Fortunate Woman, A Country Doctor's Story. I'll put a link to that in the information part of the podcast. Take me back right to the beginning, where it all started and how you gradually moved into photography. There are about three or four different paths that I've taken, that I've chosen to take or have accidentally chosen to take. The first set of circumstances was as a 10-year-old, my dad, who was um, in sales at Ford Europe, was given a posting to Brussels in 1970. So I was 10 then. And he said, and I remember them saying very clearly, you could come with us and live in Brussels or you could go to boarding school. Which would you prefer? And I said, I'll come with you. Thank you very much. And it was the best. That was the, that was the first choice I'd made that was correct. I have no idea how it, have, how it would have turned out if I had I gone to boarding school. God knows what would have happened to me. I went to Brussels and I spent the best part of the rest of my childhood and my early adulthood um, in Brussels as an expat. I went to a British school. We traveled to lots of European countries by car. We could cross the borders uh, by showing our passport to a little man in a hut on a hillside pass that would glance at our passport, raise the barrier, and we would be in Luxembourg or Holland or France or, or Germany. And we did that a lot. So I got a sense of travel and exploration from those days. After school, when I came back to the UK and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had, a, I had an inkling that I wanted to go into advertising. And I don't know why. I just thought this was a, an interesting way to deal with creativity and writing. I had a hankering to write. I wrote poetry when I was supposed to be studying for my O-levels. So I have this wadge of, of poems that are you know, full of teenage angst, girls that don't love me and rejection and all that kind of thing. And so I thought maybe I could write creatively and thought I thought advertising would be the thing. So I came back to the UK, dashed off some letters, got nowhere and ended up with a job at Southend Airport. Bear in mind, I didn't have a lot of opportunities with education. I didn't take advantage of them. I ended up with two O-levels, one of which was French. The other was English. A friend of a family who said, uh, there's jobs going for the summer season at Southend Airport. You might as well apply. If you speak French, no one else does there. And he was quite right. No one else in that airport spoke another language, or so it seemed. And so I don't know quite how what I said in the interview, but I think because I said I spoke French and I had an O-level in French, they gave me the job. And I spent six and a half years working on the ground but so primarily, it was you know, cross-purpose, cross-discipline. Cross the job was in a department called Traffic, where we would sit down with a, a three-copy sheet, and you worked out the weight and balance and center of gravity for the aircraft. So you got all the figures in from the check-in desks. They would give you long lists of passengers and broken down into males, females, children, infants. You would have average weights for all those bodies. You added them together. You added the, 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 the baggage that was weighed. You put in cargo. You added the fuel weight in and you distributed those loads around the aircraft and worked out the center of gravity. You put it all down on a sheet with the help of a chinograph pencil and an acetate wheel that you plotted and spun around according to what you were plotting in. And that's what I did for six and a half years. But as a result of working for a small airline at a very small airport, it wasn't an international airport in those days, it was just a, a gathering of sheds, I was able to get staff tickets with large airlines that flew across the world. And so I suddenly cottoned onto the idea that I quite like the idea of writing, uh, having an admin person write out a ticket for me that they would charge five pounds for and give me a free ticket there and back to somewhere like Indonesia or Singapore or Borneo. And that's how I started traveling in my spare time during my holidays. And that's where I started taking pictures because I was looking through amateur photographer and camera magazine, you know, everything that was on the, the middle shelf at Smith's. I would get all those and read them avidly. I would buy a brick of 20 or 30 rolls of Kodachrome and I would go off with my little cannons and go off and take pictures. And that's how I learned to do it myself. I was self-taught. What sparked 
start buying the camera and getting the film and starting reading photography books? Well, I'm going to lead on to that because... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> in South End Precinct, there was a little bookshop. And in a bin of, of uh, discounted books, because they were slightly damaged, was a book by Tony Ray Jones, and it was called A Day Off. I opened this up when I was at home, and it was literally a jaw-dropping moment. Here was a person, I didn't know anything about him, apart from what it said in the, in the foreword and the, uh, the introduction. Here was a person who was English, and all he seemed to do was go to events and photograph the most beautiful, the most perfect moments in heavy, heavy gloss, heavy, dense shadow, black and white photography I'd ever seen. And I just thought, I want to do this. I want to be someone that does whatever he does. However he does it, I don't know how you do it, I suppose you go to your local newspaper and you blag a position as an apprentice in the darkroom or you go and do weddings. And I didn't have a clue, but I suddenly thought this this is a way of, of earning a living. And so when I started traveling, I had in my head that I would be Tony Ray Jones with some color film in. And I think at the same time, I was looking at National Geographics because an old aunt of mine had um, donated some old copies uh, from the 60s, and I still have them. I have broken chronology from the 1960s of National Geographic. So I was looking at pictures by people like Bill Allard and James Stansfield, ultimately by people like Patrick Ward, who were showing me the world that as could be seen through the eyes of a National Geographic photographer. Of course, what I didn't realize is that all these pictures were largely set up. You know, They didn't happen as naturally as yeah. I was experiencing them. And so that dawned on me later because I was I was traveling and I was working. I was doing night shifts. I was doing day shifts, doing double t- double shifts when other people were off sick to earn the money to go and travel to buy the Kodachrome. And I was finding myself in the most extraordinary places. I mean, I was in Beirut in the early 80s during uh, a ceasefire. In my complete ignorance, I thought, well, I'll stop off in Beirut because I want to go to uh, Jordan. So I found myself in Jordan having just stopped off during a ceasefire when I wandered out of the airport building at Beirut Airport. And there were bullet holes and explosion marks along the wall. And I thought, this is very strange. In my ignorance, I had no idea what was going on. So I was learning, but and yet I was you know, really, really wet behind the ears. But that was my training ground. Yeah. And it wasn't until some years later, as I said, I was there six and a half years at South End Airport, that I went to my local library because someone had said, Richard, what the hell are you doing here coming back to this same desk doing these same shifts? You should be doing this for a living. And I still didn't really have any clues to how that might happen. But I went to South End Library, asked the librarian, did she know of any photography courses? I remember this very clearly. She poked in a box and she pulled out a prospectus and it was she said it's in Wales, South Wales in Newport. And I said, no, I have no idea where that is. It doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> I opened it up and it was a kind of concertina pullout. And there were pictures by a man called Roger Hutchings in there. And his pictures were of a protest that he'd shot for the telegraph. And it was probably of a policeman battering a protester over the head with a, with a truncheon. It was something like yeah. that. It was the most extraordinary news picture. And I just thought, an Astral Geographic? Nah. I want to be Roger Hutchings. I want to go to Newport. And I applied. I was 24. And I spent two years in Newport under the tutelage of David Hearn and Daniel Meadows and Clive Landon. Uh, it was just the most magical time. And I hark back to the first day. In fact, I put up on Instagram uh, where I, I found my original contact sheet, the very first contact sheet of Man at Work, which was an assignment that we were given. And Roger talks about this at length in the talk that he's just done for you, which reminded me of it, where you go out, you talk to, you approach a stranger and you say, can I photograph you doing whatever you do, your job? And it could have been a watchmaker. It could be a man sanding down the hull of a ship in the, in the docks. Yeah. It could have been a man carrying a slab of meat. Well, on that day, it was a man carrying a slab of meat. And you go out and you photograph one roll of black and white film, which you've come back, you've, you've processed, and you've produced a contact sheet, and you shove it in front of um, Daniel Meadows or David Hearn or any of the other lecturers, Ron McCormack. And he says, well, I like the way you've worked. You not found the essence of what it is to be that shipbuilder, that watchmaker, that butcher carrying around the slab of meat. Go back, do it again, come back with another contact sheet, I come back by five because that's when I'm going home. And you do that. And we did that for a whole term. And I don't know how many hundreds of film rolls of film I shot myself doing that before we moved on to the next assignment, which is relationships. But I went out for the first day pretty much with a spring in my step because I just thought, 
this is absolutely brilliant. I can go and take pictures of people, process them and show them to someone for the first time ever. I don't have to go back go back to South End Airport and fill out another load sheet for another sodding aeroplane that may or may not take off safely. It was extraordinary. And every time, and it might sound a bit over romantic to say this, but when I leave the house these days, I still remember that first day where I think, I don't have to go out working for a living. I can still go out and take pictures all day or as long as my legs allow me to, to my heart's content. And I can come back, look at them on my computer, send them off to Mike. And hey, presto, they might even be published within 24 hours or, or, or two weeks. And that for me is as magical as when I first walked out in heavy rain to go and photograph a man carrying a slab of meat. And um, that for me is is the magic and the intoxication that I that I still find when I look forward to doing it. And even if I don't look forward to it, and if I force myself out, I still know that I don't have to do a proper job. It, it's it's not a proper way of earning a living. It's not really a way of earning a living at all. But it's it's what I it's what gets me out of bed and fires me up. You were part of a, a really great flow of photographers which came out of Newport. Paul Law, Roger, and David Hearn is just, for me, he's so, I would say underrated somewhat. He's, he's all sort of been the silent voice of British photographers. And, and that might sound stupid in a way, but I just feel you were very lucky. I wish if I could have rewound my time around the same time, I, I would have definitely gone to Newport. But I, I was in Newcastle with John Kippen, who, for me, gave me a lot of self-belief and the words he used to give me resonate with me to this day. And, and I just sort of get that, what you're saying. It's it, them early days are really important when you're starting out. All of a sudden, you won a world press six or seven years coming out of university. That must have been a real joyous moment because the 1994 world press, you come third in the stories section. Mm. There were some heavyweight photographers in that group. Mm. I would say that there was quite a journey that I'd made after Newport to, to going and getting that or to winning that or to, to being presented with that, that piece of news that was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty astonishing. So my journey between that, if I can slightly fast forward through that, I, I came to London and I shared a, a flat with a, a, a lad called Michael Steele, who was in my year at college. And we both, uh, so Michael Steele was a sports photographer. He, he, within seemingly weeks of starting the course that we were all on, was working for The Guardian, for Eamon McCabe, uh, The Guardian, and then The Observer. He was, ended up photographing major sporting events that formed part of his folio. And he was working no. constantly. And that was his education. I mean, he became a documentary photographer, but through sport. So he and I shared um, a flat in, in Tulse Hill in South London. It was, a, it was a bit like an Elton John and Bernie Taupin moment. You know, we were both put together and he was working constantly. He was working every day. And I was sat there watching TV during the daytime wondering, how the hell am I going to make an in, inroad? And it took me some months of, of figuring it out. And I, I found a way of doing it through women's magazines. It was a, a bower um, title called Best Magazine. It was new. And someone who knew the picture editor said, listen, she needs three or four set up pictures a week to slot in single column, little pictures to describe the uh, article. And typical article was why you should always get a quote from your plumber before you he fixes your taps. So so for two hundred pounds, I mean, you know, in nineteen eighty six, seven, that was quite was all right. That was good rent money. That and if I did three of those a week, I, I was made. I would do three of those uh, at a time, and they would pay expenses plus processing. We would take it down to Joe's basement, get the couple of contact sheets processed, and I would set up these pictures with anyone and, and anybody that I knew. I roped in family members, friends. My in-laws, I mean, they were, the, they were the elderly couple who would be looking over the, the man dressed with a boiler suit, looking at a piece of paper that was supposed to be the quote, all that kind of stuff. Boom, 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 back down the motorway, in for processing, day's work done. It was so easy. And I did, I did, I did a lot of those. And at some point, somebody then said to me, Are you free on Saturday? Oh, I, I meant to say, I, I was trying to make inroads with the Observer. And I think like Roger described, I had tried countless times to get an appointment to show what essentially were college pictures. Yeah. I certainly wasn't showing them best magazine pictures. 
to the gatekeepers of the picture editor. Now, these were people who answered the phone on the picture desk at the Observer. Roger's quite right. You phoned on a, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday before the week got going, before they were busy. And I could not make any inroads with them. There was no chance in hell that, that I was going to get an appointment to show the picture editor, whose name was Tony McGrath, my work. I, it must have taken me a year or so of, no, no, we're not free, or, yeah, come in. And I went in and never got to see the picture editor, saw a, a deputy, another gatekeeper, who said, yeah, all right, well, see a lot of this stuff, but, you know, keep at it, young man, and I'm sure you'll, you'll make it good someday. But some while later, a friend of mine called Bill Robinson, who was a regular freelance for The Observer, said, are you busy? Are you busy Saturday? Because I tell you what, the OBS need someone to cover an event. And I mentioned you, and they don't know who the hell you are. But if you, if you want to do the job, then give them a ring. And I rang and said, uh, this is Rich Baker. I hear through Bill. You remember Bill, you know, your regular freelance that you're looking for someone for Saturday. And, it, and the man I was talking to was, um, was Tony McGrath. <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, yeah, right, whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, I want you to go and photograph a tortoise weighing competition Saturday morning. Be back by two. I need the uh, film dev and I need to see the contact sheet by half three at the latest or whatever. And I did it. And um, I showed him the contact and he said, oh, these are really nice. And I said, oh, it's really nice of you. He said, we're not going to run it, but uh, have I got your number? And, and he rang me the Monday or the Tuesday morning the next week and he said, if you want work, you can work for me. I, I li like what you did on the Saturday. Sorry, we couldn't use it. And I worked for them solidly for the next, I guess it was 18 months. If Certainly not under two. It was under two years, maybe 18 months. And I worked as a regular freelance for the OBS alongside, and get this, it, I was alongside people like Neil Libert, mm. uh, Sue Adler, Jane Bone, uh, Eamon McCabe, Roger, John Reardon. They were people whose mm. pictures I'd been looking at in the Observer when I was at college for, you know, with, with huge amount of admiration. Here was I sharing a dark room. I would go in with some really dodgy negatives that I had to process, and I was no, I, I had no idea how much um, how much shadow detail I'd have in in these negatives. So Jane Baum would typically come up to me and she'd say, "Are you um, you okay?" She said, um, "I like what you did on you know last Saturday. It was a nice picture of whoever it was, David Attenborough, or whatever it was." And she said, um, "Can I show you something?" <laughs> she said, uh, "I want you to get the film out of the tank." and look at it under the red light. So halfway through the dev, she would show me how to get the neg out of the, the tank, unfurl it in the, in the, uh, off the spiral, and look at it. So it was half developed, half an image there. I had no idea what I was looking at. She said, give it an extra rub with your finger, and you'll get out more detail in the, in the shadow areas. Right. And so that's how I, I learned to you know, almost relearn the art of developing a neg and then having someone printed afterwards. Um, you didn't make the prints yourself. They had a darkroom technician right. who would produce big 1216s that would be used to reproduce for the paper. So I was absolutely gobsmacked that these, literally these icons of British photo photography were alongside me showing me how to do it. And I was, yeah. I was two years out of college at that point. So at that point, I said, um, after two years, I was saying to Tony McGrath, Okay, I'd like to go and photograph in Poland. So this is 1990. So the ball had come down. I would like to do a trip around Eastern Europe. Would you help me with some money? And that would um, guarantee you the first look at the black and white pictures. I said, but on the basis that I can shoot some color along alongside. I was thinking in, in terms of color stories again, because I was looking in the, uh, the color magazines and looking at the work of Barry Lewis and yeah. Steve Bembo and Chris Pillitz. Ernst Haas, uh, Harry Greer, and a, this beautiful color landscape and reportage work that was in the color supplements. I wanted to progress onto that. I kind of saw that I'd, I'd not, um, I didn't want to part ways with the Observer, but I wanted to work alongside them. McGrath said, forget it, forget it. If you want to work for me, you will work solely for me. I don't want to have you saying, no, you can't work and going off and doing a color story. Nah. So I uh, choose. And I chose the color route. And um, I went to, well, I did the Poland trip and I shot color alongside it anyway. Um, I think they used some pictures anyway because it proved what was going on in small town Polish towns um, in post-communism. That worked out okay. But I went and did a, a story in 
uh, Florence, and it's a medieval football match called the Calcio. And it goes back to the traditions of the 1400s when rival churches have, would have their own, I say, football te- teams. It was a sporting team that involved a, f- a round ball. They kicked around, but they also kicked and, kicked and punched the living daylights out of each other. So all four churches in Florence had their own teams. And they repeat the tradition today of having playoffs in the middle of Florence. And I love this idea. So I went back and photographed this and took it back to a picture editor who um, had seen my work at Newport. And he's a ma- he was a man called um, Christopher Angeliglou. And he was the picture editor of the Sunday Express magazine, who people like Steve Benbow and Barry Lewis were regularly being uh, commissioned for. Yeah. And I went back to Christopher and I said, hey, do you remember me? You saw me at Newport. I've just shot these pictures in Florence. And he said, oh, these are, these are really nice. I'm not going to publish them. But <laughs> again, if you want to work for me, I'd love to give you jobs. And I worked for him for another two years or so where he would commission me to do similar things that he was giving Barry to do. I think Barry had the, uh, he had the, the cherries. He had the, the nicer ones. I got the, I got the second and third drawdown stories. But I didn't mind. I was doing regular work for him. His successor was a man called John Live. John Live used me as well. And he, uh, on one occasion in the early spring of 1993, I think it was, said, I'd like you to go and photograph seaside towns for me. I want to see the best hotel. I want to see the best plate of prawns with the beach in the background. I want to see uh, seaside pictures, the picture of the pier. I want to see the hotels. So do that for me. He, he'll, there will be some copy for you to illustrate that will come to you every Thursday or Friday. Go off for the long weekend, come back, and we'll we'll publish them three or four weeks later. And that's color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Color, color, color. And I did that. And after the first couple, I realized that I was taking pictures that he wouldn't have been interested in whatsoever. They were personal pictures. They were pictures that might have been paid for by him, but I knew that he, he it was way outside of his aesthetic for the Sunday Express magazine. They were quirky pictures of people enjoying their lives at the seaside town. And, then, and they were essentially street pictures. They were, yeah. they were funny. They were off the wall. They were quite Martin Parr-esque. And there was a bit of fill-in flash there. And those were the pictures that, some, that someone said at um, the agency that I then joined, Cat's Pictures, from the very beginning. Yeah. He said, um, why don't you put those into World Press? You never know. Um, and I did. And I, I, 12 pictures, we, I think we spent an afternoon shuffling them around on the light box as transparencies, put them in, forgot about them. And then that same person phoned me um, weeks or months later and said, have you, seen, have you seen the news? Have you got an email from Well Press? And I said, <laughs> no. Why? He said, well, you, just, you just won a prize. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. So um, yeah, that was the journey between yeah. uh, Newport and, and winning that. So if I, you know, that's come full circle. And you really summed up how difficult the 90s was to be a photographer who wanted to do something. The routes were there, but the journey to get that, the roads were congested in terms of getting to picture editors, getting your work out. Yeah. And you still do a lot of work off your own back, purely, I think, because you had your apprenticeship then as well. Exactly. You've always done that. Exactly. I was sort of laughing when you were talking about you not being able to see the picture editor. And I spent years doing that, being rejected. And that's why I went down the corporate route, because it was easier. Was it? Oh, you found that easier. Oh, okay. Corporate work in the 90s, yeah. Okay, interesting you say that. Okay, so in the mid to late 90s, a lot of us at the agency found that, okay, some, someone at the agency took on a corporate rep. So all of a sudden, that rep came to us and said, okay, all these beautiful pictures that you take of the magazines, I want you to put those into a folio, a special corporate folio, because I reckon that I can get you corporate jobs. And we went, mm. you got to be joking. <laughs> what you mean? Working for companies and, and, uh, and annual reports and, and, and ads. And they went, Absolutely, you up for it? And we went. Well, how much? How much do we we make? Well, so, well you'll pay a lot. You'll get, you'll get three or four times as much. Oh, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of reductance about it. But the first folio I sweated over. That took me bloody months to get right. It was the early days of Photoshop and InDesign and Epson printers. I couldn't get my color profiles right. They were, I was all over the place. I was using burning up a lot of ink and paper. It was a disaster. I got some help eventually, and I got a, a friend, a, a designer, who um, laid out the pictures for me, and we made a, a little design job of it. Made three or four copies. 
gave them to the corporate rep and ended up within weeks or months of, of corporate annual reports to do for companies in lots of different countries and traveling the world economy yeah, yeah. you know high pressure as you know you know you, there's these things are no holiday you might be put up in a really nice hotel with a, a decent dinner at the end of it but boy did they get their pound of flesh out of you and um that then actually for a while shunted away the commissions for magazines because before that i was doing yeah I was working for lots of really good magazines. I was getting pages in big French and German and American magazines. I was covering news events, Time, Newsweek, Stern, yeah. you name it. But when I started the corporate work, they all got shunted to one side and I lost touch with that very quickly. And I suddenly realized, actually, I don't want to be doing this forever. Yeah. But coincidentally, maybe whereas you persevered with it, I found it really difficult to not to, to deal with the relationship I had with these designers who commissioned me to do these, and they were really professional people. I really liked them. and I loved traveling around with them. I found it, found it more difficult to deal with them than with actually with picture editors and, and writers and journalists who would traditionally commission me to do you know, really interesting stories in different countries. So I was really torn. Yeah. Well, I think with somewhere like Cats and getting the corporate section in the office, I think that was a, a lot of that is Giga to high end corporate work, which is which used to pay thousands a day. I mean, massive assignments all over the world. Yet, yeah. what I did was I went below that and uncovered this vast, this sort of amazing amount of corporate Britain, which was underneath the annual reports. And because it was a time for there was budgets, people wanted to spend money, people wanted to promote their businesses, and me and Jez Coulson really sort of got into that and we worked hard at that. I did do a few annual reports, but I remember being in a flash center once and um, I was getting some flash kit out, as every photo the photographer did there. I was sitting next to, I knew sort of Paul Lowe at the time and he was standing mourning and grumping. I hope he listens to this. <laughs> and he, um, he, was got a grump, <laughs> he was grumping and groaning about a big sheet he's got to do. And I'm grumping and groaning about my sheet and I'm grumping and groaning because I've only got two days in sort of um, Hartlepool or somewhere like that. And Paul's grumping and groaning that he's just got 25 days around yeah. the world shooting for like four grand a day. And I'm like, do you want to swap? But that was the nature of the beast. And Paul was very established. It's a really interesting, interesting period. And then you were at, through Cat, and then you obviously knew a mutual friend of mine, John Easterby. And I think did that lead on to IPG? They were strange times. I love they were. I loved the um, the cats pictures era. It started by literally it was Christopher Angeloglu again at the Sunday Express magazine. He said, "You really need to put old oh boy." He said, "You need to put these pictures uh, from your medieval football into an agency." And I said, "Oh well, I know who I'd like to join. I'd love to join Colorific because they shoot. They have some wonderful work." He said, "You won't get a look in there." <laughs> but. <laughs> Uh, run by Shirley, um, and it was uh, Shirley, and it was the Lagubins. Barry, pardon? No, sorry, I thought she was saying Shirley. Oh Barry no, there. Shirley Barry ran. Camber, no, it wasn't Camber Press. It was the other one, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, someone will, someone will put me right on this, but not not on this occasion. So the Lagubins, uh, who were um, husband and wife partnership, they ran Colorific. They were the, in my mind, the best color agency in London. But there were a whole yeah. host of others. If you just touched on. There was impact. There was network. Of course, there was network. Yeah. There was Format, the women's agency. Yeah. There was Cats. Troika. Yeah. There were a lot of very small agencies yeah. who, of course, have all, all disappeared because they were swallowed up. Mm. It was a golden but funny time. Cats, when I first joined, Jeff Katz was from Colorific. He had left Colorific to, to start his own agency. And he was running Katz Pictures from his front room. And when I first phoned him, he said, well, I've got one filing cabinet and one drawer of pictures. If you want to start contributing, because I, I can see that you've, that you've got some passion there and I like your color. If you want to start adding, he said, I will get sales for you straight away. And he did. So I was the second photographer through the door at Katz. All those years later, after it was sold to Hachette, That's right. I was the, almost the last out of the door because all the photographers that came and went, and I drew up a list here of photographers who was at Cats and then uh, its spin-off IPG. And I've got here Tom Stoddart, David Medell, Zed Nelson, Harry Borden, Keith Bernstein, John Reardon, Roger Hutchings, Alistair Thane, Derek Hudson. And there were more. Peter Dench. Peter Dench. Oh, how could I forget Peter Dench? <laughs> 
Oh, God, How I could you forget Peter Dench? Don't, don't share this with him. <laughs> of course, Peter Dench. They were big names. And I was rubbing shoulders and, and we were all looking over each other's shoulders at the light boxes when we came back from whatever it was we were doing. And it was a golden time for feedback. I mean, you know, there was one night when I got word on the TV, there was a news break where uh, they said uh, a jet has fallen out of the sky and hit a town in Scotland. I think we swapped phone calls and Tom said, well, I'm, I'm halfway up there already. <laughs> He had a little be- beaten up old um, Persia, and he was he was literally already on the road, I think. And he went up there, and I said, "Oh, it's a long way to go. Maybe not." And I didn't go, and it's one of the big mistakes of my life that I didn't go up to Lockerbie. But just about everyone else I knew did. But what I did do was help Steve Blog, who was then one of the editors and co- co-founders of, of the agency, alongside Jeff. He said, "Well, we're, we're going to have Tom's film coming back, you know, I think it was the next night someone had run it back down for him down the motorway as a favor. And I saw Tom's work coming in, raw film, bread across the light box. And, mm. we, and I helped edit and cut it up and caption it. You couldn't make those, those little incidents up because as Tom then went on to do more important black and white project yeah. that became his lifelong work that was outside you know the work that he did for seven days on the telegraph magazine and, and news magazine yeah i could see his work coming in his prints and his work print his contact sheets that he would show me it was like being at magnum it was a bit like seeing um you know eugene smith's work coming in roy it was it was priceless so i know i learned an awful lot from those people all of them <laughs> And I have a great deal of gratitude for them. Yeah. And they're still friends today. And, and uh, sadly, you know, Tom's gone. Um, John Reardon's gone. Uh, and I've lost touch with the others. But Yeah. What was the pub we used to go down to in Shoreditch? I forgot the name. Because I used to go down and have a beer with John. On Vine Hill. Oh, 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 in short. Oh, it was the Fox. That's right, yeah. Did you used to go down there? We probably drank at the same time in there. Zach, I'm not a big drinker, but, you know, there were occasions to go and celebrate one thing or another. There was a heavy lunchtime drinking culture, I have to say, and, and I couldn't stand that. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I don't have the disposition to, to drink pints and then edit or go out and shoot pictures in the afternoon. Yeah. So we'd go and have lunch sometimes, but yeah. A lot of deals were done on the phone at that time, you know, from from the Fox. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it was it was classic. Yeah. It's classic Magnum stuff. Yeah. It was a, a network as well. Network were in the same building. Yeah. Network had been in two same buildings as us in via, in uh, Kirby yeah. Street first of all in Hatton Garden and then um, in Settland House in Shoreditch. Yeah. So we were rubbing shoulders with with them too and yeah. going covering th- the same things. I mean, on uh, 9-11, yeah. that was an occasion when I did go and Tom and I shared a flight. We shared a hotel room and we walked the streets together and sometimes split up, but came together with John Reardon and Zed, who was there as well. We met up in the mm. evenings to compare notes and to, to see what the hell was going on. David Medell was there as well. We were all covering it for different people. It was a great learning curve to go out and learn uh, alongside these people. And I kind of missed that. Yeah, it was, there was a, a lot to do and um, great personalities and great friends. Who else was there at the time as well in terms of the admin staff? Tara? Was Tara, Tara there? Tara Banacta. Uh, yeah, I went, I went to university with Tara. Did you? I did. And I know Lisa as well. Oh, was Lisa there? yeah, yeah. Lisa, Lisa was one of our corporate reps. Lisa Pritchard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now she's got her own agency. In her own right. When she left IPG, she came into our building. Was, we had Insight, which is in Labs Conduit Passage. So she moved upstairs and set up the corporate side of, course. Um, of course. Um, Insight, where we were in the editorial side and corporate side. Yeah. So, yeah. Of course. Should have mentioned Insight along with that, yes. that whole... Um, <laughs> cast list of great agencies at the time i mean jez is an outstanding photographer and i, I love the man to death he was my sort of rock we were a sort of agency mm. where other people would ring us because jobs had been messed up elsewhere and they would say this job's being messed can you go and do this and we would do anything anything would come in we would just do it just send us the postcode and we'll go and do the pictures <laughs> That's what it was about then, because going back to your initial discussions about knocking at doors and trying to get established, it was a beautiful period. There was lots of money around, and it was hard work. It was hard to maintain, and you just had to be ready for it. And I don't think that period, you're ever gonna, you'll never get that again. It was such a beautiful period to be a photographer in, but, God, it was hard work. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I just think if you were young, 
Yeah. And you had energy and you just wanted to succeed. It was a bit like being a dancer. You know, if you turned up to the auditions and you danced well and you, you were nice, uh, you were civil and you weren't an asshole and you would get there eventually. Yeah. And, and if you were, even if you were half competent, you would get there eventually. It, it just took a lot of commitment. And yeah. everyone around one, um, you know, shared it. You fed off each other. And you looked at the magazines on a Saturday or a Sunday, and there was someone else's work. And you go, God, I would like to have done that one, you know. And, and maybe on the Monday or the Tuesday, maybe the phone rang and you were offered something similar. Maybe it wasn't, you weren't, and you still went outside and did anything. And But you're right. In the, in the practice I have today, by going out and yeah. chasing and looking my own without any without the phone ringing, I, it's nothing unusual. Some people have never been able to work like that. And I've always found that quite intuitive. It's an amazing time. Now, let's talk about The Red Arrows. Phenomenal book. It was a book what needed to be done, The Red Arrows, wasn't it? Man, it must have been amazing flying in them jets. Yes. Here's the story. Someone at the agency lived next door to someone who was, uh, this is up in Gloucestershire. So Stefan Eriksson was one of the directors of Cats in the later years. He lived next door to someone in Gloucestershire who was someone who worked in public relations at the MOD with a special responsibility to the RAF, but with a passion for the Red Arrow. So I'd seen those red jets flying through the blue sky at South End Seafront for on occasions. Because I'd worked in aviation, I knew what they were about. I knew that they turned up at air shows, and I knew that they were loved by millions of people. And the seafronts and the mall was always crammed full when they flew over with their red, white, and blue smoke. But that's really all I knew. A British tradition. Hugely. Hugely. Yeah. I had no idea what they were about. I didn't even realize, I suspect that a lot of other people don't realize, is that they all have a, a heritage of being frontline fighter pilots. Mm. They've seen action. And so when Stefan came to me and said, so Glyn, this lives next door to me, um, I've shown her some of your aviation work. And I'd done a project about aviation in the context of it being almost the 100th anniversary of the first Wright Brothers flight in 2003. So this was about 1999, 2000. No, it was 2001. Anyway, but I was in the midst of that that project and she had seen some of these pictures and they were shot on Color Neg on 6.6 and 6.7 Mamiya rangefinder cameras. That's what I was using at the time. I'd sort of shunned 35 mil and I would, I'd gone off on a tangent that no one quite understood and perhaps neither did I, but that's what I was using. We've not talked about camera and phone, but we'll do that after All right, the, if you insist. After this. Is. <laughs> so, cut a long story short, she said, Richard liked to do something with the RAF. She said, I would arrange it. I would, I would make it happen for him. I would open the doors. I would basically sanction it because ultimately, if a request is made to the MOD and it's to do with the RAF and it's to do with journalism or a, an arts project, it would have to come across my desk and I would either stamp it, yes or no. So she was quite a good person to know. Yeah. We went to see her and, I, and she presented us with a whole idea of ideas. And it was, you know, spend a week with a tornado squadron at RAF Lossy Mouth. Well, that sounds nice. Will I get to fly with them? Well, possibly. Well, okay. What, what else have you got? Well, you could fly with another squadron. They have different aircraft. You could do it another week. And I said, okay. And then she ran through these options. And then last thing she mentioned, she said, oh, by the way, she said, the Red Arrows are celebrating their 40th anniversary uh, next year, the, within 18 months or so, you could go up for a couple of days and do the thing on the Red Arrows. And I went, oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> and I went up there within a couple of weeks and walked in to their base in RAF Scampton and just walked into this inner sanctum. They weren't wearing red suits because this was winter. So this is just as they're starting their winter training. This is like a September or October no. 2003. Pre-season. Yeah, pre-season. They're not wearing red suits because they're a new team. They take on a number of new crew and new engineers every year, and they have to train them up. They have to learn a new routine. So the winter months, as you know, because you've maybe seen the book, they have to learn a new routine and learn what it is to be a red arrow yeah. and start from scratch. And so I came in when the new team members were new themselves. They were newbies, and everyone didn't know each other. And they treated me with a huge amount of suspicion because the last photographer that they had allowed in had done a book, as it was told to me, he had half-inched a red flying suit, put it on, walked out to the aircraft and held his cameras up and got someone to snap a picture of him by the tail 
when the team found out that someone had, had nicked a Red Arrow suit and put it on and, and ostensibly become an imposter in their eyes, yeah. they kicked him out. They said, you're not coming in here ever again. So on that basis, I was the guy that fell in to his footsteps. Yeah. And so they didn't like the idea of me either. But bit by bit, my approach was, I suppose, in, in all senses, when you're faced with a strange audience or you've been allowed access into a private world as this was, you have to tread very carefully. I trod on eggshells really for the first couple of weeks. Yeah, but you're used to that. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is if I would bowled in there and shot yeah. and shot and shot with these quiet cameras, I think my days would have been numbered. What I decided to do was actually not to go anywhere near the pilots for the first couple of weeks, actually for the first month. Yeah. I spent time downstairs with the engineers, with the blokes in their boiler suits, yeah. who were crawling underneath in and out of these aircraft, sticking their heads in, shining lights, finding stress faults, tightening bolts, mending, repairing, maintaining. And I got to know how the hell this team worked through them, not through the pilots. Yeah. And it wasn't until I realized that actually they were starting to ask, well, where's the bloody photographer gone? He's never here. There's things starting to happen. The team is taking shape. And I suddenly found that actually I was being asked upstairs to share their flying world. And that's how I pieced it together very quickly. To cut a long story short, I didn't stay just days or weeks, but I stayed about nine months wow. in that I would typically photograph for a week up there. And I was shooting, you know, 6.6 six and 6.7 six, color neg that needed very careful processing down uh, Metro down in Clerkenwell, just around the corner from the agency. Yeah. So I would come and photograph for a week and then come back for another week, process, look at the work. I would copy some of the work and take up some of the contacts back up to the team to show you, show them what I was doing. There was a kind of constant you know, show and tell and, and can you let me do a little bit more week by week, not even assuming they were going to let me stay for another, for another period. And then uh, and that time in, in back in London, I would do little other jobs. So, you know, the income was, was still flowing in. Yeah. So after nine months, during winter training, I went to, I joined them to their training schedule in Cyprus twice when they were given their permission to fly to their PDA, their permission to display authority, which is when they earn their red suits. It's like earning their badge. They are then allowed yeah. by the MOD to display in front of the crowd. They, they pass a very special test that they build up yeah. to. So I was able to photograph the whole of that build up. And I got quite emotional, you know, the day that they were given it. You know, there's a lot of stress, a lot of tension because failing in their eyes is really not an option. They're allowed to take the test again. It's like taking taking a driving test twice, but you don't want to. You want to yeah. you want to succeed first time around because that's the psychology that these people who have become top of their tree anyway, regardless of whether they're the red arrows, they are the top of their top gun tree. And although they don't like that label, that's the way they like to do it. We pass together, we pass first time. Yeah. But the build up to that is quite extraordinary. And I saw this happening in front of me and I tried to make the pictures reflect that. Thereafter, I followed them around the country uh, and other to some air shows in Europe to illustrate their flying season. There was one occasion when I decided I wanted to go and see the Bastille fly past. They were invited by the French Air Force and the French uh, military to close the Bastille Day with their fly past over the Arc de Triomphe. Wow. So I thought, well, that's one I can't miss. I'll get on the first Eurostar, which was at, at Waterloo then at five something. I got on the train, got to Paris and thought, right, I'll get a, get a cab to take me as close to the Arc de Triomphe on the Champs Elysees as possible. Got there and found that there was um, a taxi strike. All the taxi drivers were out on strike. There was no cars to be got. I either had to walk or run from the Gare du Nord, which was a bloody long way and it was hot, or I had to get the metro and then get out near near the Louvre. I got up got out near the Louvre where I was faced with barriers and there were, you know, there was high security because of the French military parade that would come down the Champs Elysees. I found my, I realized I couldn't get to the Champs Elysees and I realized that their fly past time was within minutes. So I ran to the Louvre. We well, you know the, the triangular, the pyramid shaped dome there. Yeah. And I realized that there could be a picture in there because otherwise there ain't no picture. I've come all this way. They're going to fly over. Yeah. That's it. That's all I'm going to get. If I miss it and I'm winding on frame by frame by frame, I, there's no all, there's no motor drive here. There's no 20 frames per second. Yeah. It's frame by frame by frame. I'm going to miss it. And sure enough, 
I realized that they're due. And I make a phone call. I make one phone call to Red 10. He's the ground operations man. He's the man in the red suit who stands there with a microphone on the seafront and says, ladies and gentlemen, get your cameras out ready for the red arrows. And here they come. And they're in such and such a formation. And next, they're going to do that. And then they're going to be in that or another. And then they're going to fly past. And it's been lovely having he is he's standing as I as I ring him on the top of the Arc de Triomphe and he's standing wow. next to French generals. And I phone him and say, Steve, Steve, when are they due? I'm by, I'm in position. <laughs> and he goes, Do not talk to me. I am talking to the team. I'm talking to these generals, but they're due in 30 seconds. And I think, Christ, this this is gonna be such a disaster. But they come over in a position, in a formation, which is a V, and it's called Big Battle. They don't I don't know if they do it anymore, but their arrival, their fly past position is when you've got red one, the very front jet, is at the front of the, as the apex of the V, and the rest all tail off either side uh, behind him. Perfect, perfect formation. Double strength, red, white, and blue, extra die in the tanks. They come over. I get, I don't know, three frames as it comes over. And just as they're coming past, I see that they're their smoke is reflected in the side of the pyramid that's that's highly reflective. And I shoot, I don't know, I think it's two or three frames. And there's a person, there's a lady in red that's just underneath with the crowd. And she's where she, she echoes the red jets. The shape of the pyramid echoes the shape of the big battle. And I think, well, you know, you, I can't see on the back of the screen. You know, I have to wait yeah. till the Monday to see if I've got it or not. And I go back to the hotel where the team have collected. They've landed, got a, their own transport back to the hotel where they're staying, and their wives are there, and I'm taking pictures of them. And I, I think, at least I think, well, if I've got nothing else, I've got some pictures of the men in their red suits under pictures, uh, paintings of Napoleon, and that will make a picture perhaps. Uh, of course, that picture that where they're coming across is my best-selling picture of them. It worked so nicely that it's what people want because – there's a metaphor about Anglo-French relationships, of course, which is big now as, 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 as I suppose it was then. But it, it was so symbolic that the RAF were closing the French military parade. And yeah. French people love that. And they still look at it and comment on it, occasionally buy a nice print. And because it's, it's a long distance picture on a sharp neg, it's only 500th of a second. That, that's all the camera goes up to. You know, If it was any closer, they wouldn't be sharp. Yeah. But because the smoke and the sky and everything works so nicely, it's uh, one of the nicest pictures that I, that I took. But to answer your question about flying with them, I at some point I said to them, okay, look, I've done an awful lot of stuff on the ground. And I said, I would like to see what you look like looking down on. I want to see what it's like from the cockpit. And they said, well, that camera you're using isn't cleared by the Ministry of Defense. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, not cleared. I said, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not using, you know, I'm not using flash. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no chance of explosion. And they said, yeah, well, we'll have to get it cleared. What I didn't realize is that's actually that's their way of saying, just behave yourself. We'll let you in to the cockpit. You will fly with us. You will get some training on the ejection seat. You will have a medical each time you fly to check your blood pressure and to make sure that you know that your pupils dilate when they're supposed to. There's, there's not going to be a medical emergency in the air because when we do tight turns, you will be experiencing high G-forces, and, I, and, and we will train you to do that. And, and that's what they did. Yeah, They sit you in the seat. They strap you into this uh, this ejection seat that's on a trolley in one of their rooms, and they show you what happens when you pull the pin, that when one of them says, eject, 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 because there's an emergency, you must do it. And if you don't, you will be in the ground within a few seconds, that kind of thing. So they scare the life out of you. They say, here's a sick bag. We call it a pick and mix after the bag that you get from Woolworths when you choose your own sweets. You will have that in your pocket. Yeah. If you feel sick, you will not throw up in the cockpit. You will throw up in the air, in the air, in the bag. Okay, got that. I know when to pull the pin. I know how to hold my breath now and grunt and hold all the blood down in my stomach so it doesn't rush to your head. That's when you pass out. All those kind of things. And they said, okay, you're clear. And um, I went eventually on six flights with them. I flew on lots of different positions where the air display that they're doing looks different from each position. So, for example, if I'm with Red 1, in the back of Red 1, because they're two-seater jets, the formation is different 
as opposed to when I'm at the aircraft at the very back where I can see through the perspex at the others above me, around me. So I would plan each picture I want to do on each flight. So bearing in mind that I've got the 6-7 Mamiya, yeah. I've taken- Manual focus. Manual focus. It's focused, pre-focused and taped to infinity. I've removed the strap because they don't want the strap snagging on the stick that's in front of you. So the stick that is waggling around in front of you is echoing the, the inputs that he's putting in in the front cockpit. So it's waggling around in front of you. They do not want any strap snagging on that stick because that's going to echo his inputs. He will then lose control of the aircraft. And bearing in mind, in some display formations, we are seven feet from another wingtip. He doesn't want that. So I'm very conscious that I have to take off the, uh, the strap. Uh, and also that I've um, taped up any sharp edges, like so the lugs of the straps, there's sharp lugs that are on either side, there's silver things, they're all taped up with gaffer tape. I've also gaffer taped up the, the film back, so I don't want any accidents where the film back's opening up. I've got 20 pictures to photograph each display, <laughs> that's it. So I will do one flight, I will shoot 20 pictures, 20 frames, I will, uh, at the end of my week, go back home and I will see that film, those pictures for the first time on the Monday morning when Metro have processed my contact sheets. So there's a lot of wastage there. And each, each flight, I, I make the same mistakes. You know, I'm not judging the moment because there's one press of the button each time I want to shoot the picture. I've worked out with the pilot and sometimes it's with he's within the formation and sometimes we've flown in an extra jet where we're what's called photo chasing. We're flying above the whole formation. I'm looking down on them where he's tilting the wing 90 degrees and I'm looking down on them and I'm seeing in glorious detail the fields of England. This is Engl England's pleasant pastures. This is the iconic red arrows with England in the background. We've got We've got f uh, farmer's fields. We've got roads running through. We've got the A15, which is the, a large diagonal road that I use. That's a Roman road. And the Roman road has only been diverted to allow for the, the lengthening of their runway back in the uh, 70s or 80s. So yeah. there's history here. And there's something I want to say about looking down on these red aeroplanes with green fields in the background. And because it's shot at an infinity at a 500th of a second, everything is really sharp. I think they then realized that actually, because this is in the very, very early days of digital, their own photographers are using early digital cameras. I've never used a digital camera in my life. I'm using the film and the cameras that I only I've ever used for some years before, and I know what they're going to do for me. So they're very unique pictures. And I don't believe anyone's done it before, and certainly not since, that mm. these pictures are very non-aviation aesthetic. They're not plane spotter pictures. And actually, yeah. I got strange reaction from when eventually I found a publisher for a book by complete accident. I finished the project. I had the pictures. They were scans on CDs and on hard drives, but I had no publisher. Ultimately, when I found a publisher by complete accident by someone I met on a, a job for Stern magazine at, at a car event, actually, it was um, uh, not Mercedes. Um, who's uh, Lewis Hamilton's other team? Um, down in Woking. McLaren. McLaren. It was a job at McLaren I did for Stern magazine. Met a writer yeah. who said, I know a person that would publish this. He's an accountant, but he's got his own publishing company and everyone else turned me down. Can you believe it? Ultimately, I found a publisher, but by that time, Cat's IPG had folded. I had no agency. So I, I had a project mm. and a publisher, but I had no no support crew. I had no Taraban actors. I had no Seamus O'Clearances. I had no Toms or yeah. or David Medells or Zeds to show this work to. I was completely on my own, very isolated. But I had a feeling that a man who I knew designed books would help me. And that was a man called Smith. His name is, do you know him? No. Stuart Smith. No, I've never met him. No. Stuart Smith was did fine art uh, at the same right. time as me at Newport. Right. Uh, so not fine art. He did graphic design. He was a graphic designer. He was publishing books for Magnum. He is the book designer for Elliot Erwitt and lots of Magnum books. He was um, just best in London. He was the best book designer in London. I still believe he is. He just specialises in photography books. And I said to him, "Hey, Stu, it's me, Richard. I've just done this thing." Would you take a look at it? Oh, well, okay then. And I took him some uh, work prints and some, yeah, I think they were work prints. And he said, well, I'll do um, a dummy for you, but until you find a publisher, I ain't interested. <laughs> you need to find someone to 
publish this for you. So it all fell together in sequence. Once I found the publisher, I knew that Stu would help me. We worked on this together uh, in the in 2004, the summer of 2004, at his studio in um, Clerkenwell. And so we spent some months putting this book together painstakingly. I suppose what I would do differently now is if I if I had my time again with the same material, and let's say this is still 2004, I wouldn't have made it a wordy book because I would, in the latter stages of going backwards and forwards to the agency on the bus, I would sit at the back and I'd write up my notes and I would essentially write book and transpose what I was writing down at the time, my feelings, my experiences, the technical stuff, I, which I ultimately put into the book. A lot of our time yeah. ultimately was spent in editing the words and the text for the book rather than the picture. If we'd just made it a picture-only book with a brief intro by one of the Red Arrows team or something, that would have been quite feasible to do. It would have taken us a lot, lot less time. As it was, the writing and the editing of the writing, because I hired a, an editor to do just that, turned into a real nightmare. And we fell out. Stu and I were having to deal with this person who, I'm not sure what was what was going on in her life, but it, it, it wasn't a happy time. Ultimately, we got it published and it was printed. The publisher allowed me to go to Singapore. He paid for my air flight to go down to Singapore wow. for me to go on press. And it was it was a great time. And Wow. <laughs> ultimately... Imagine if you had Instagram then. Oh when you were my Singapore. God. If I had Instagram, there was no Twitter, there was no Instagram. I could have. I've published a couple of books, but the thing I have never done has been on press. And that's just something I may never experience. It was a lovely thing. And, and you know what? You walk into the small printing press in an industrial estate in Singapore and they've got, they've got their little dot matrix board yeah. out, you know, yeah. their little stick on letters. And they're saying, welcome, Mr. Richard oh. Baker, Red Arrows. And it was you a lovely VIP, thing. And they, and they took me to lunch, to, to Singapore street food. And then we'd come back and then they'd wake me up in the middle of the night <sighs> to check on another sheet. And I'd, I'd sleep on a camp bed. In their, so romantic. Oh, a camp bed in their, in their VIP P1, you know, their executive boardroom. You've made it then, mate. I mean, that's that's just that's what it's about. You it know? was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. I disagree with you on the um had you had it done it again, you would have made it a just a photo book. I think it's a great book. I think it needed that personal end to it. It needed the, the text, the diagrams, it needed all of that. Um uh, I, I I had I felt that I had to tell their story because they gave up so much of their time and resources to helping me. Of course you did. Not only during it, but afterwards as well. They fact-checked every sheet and they came back with corrections and wording and terminology mm. that wasn't quite right. And so I felt that I, I owed it to them That's great, to tell their story. And you know what, uh, Zach, the ultimate accolade, the ultimate honor I had was for them to buy it. I mean, I gave them a free copy each, every member of the team, hundred. A hundred or so, they got a free copy of the book yeah. that was allowed for in the printing um, print run. Yeah. Uh, but they not and so they not only did that, and we all signed each other's books, and they wrote some lovely things in my book, and they smeared red and blue dye all across the the, the signature page, which which was which was lovely. Yeah, 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 and completely vandalised it, which is great. But they all bought copies for their own families because they said, yeah. this is our time. This is the time when we're young men of doing course. an extraordinary thing. And even now, I'm in touch with them. And we hark back because the, the hierarchy doesn't exist anymore. They're not Red Arrows pilots. Mm. And I'm not just some other photographer who happened to visit them for sometimes the last year of their RAF careers. Nowadays, we're, we're friends who exchange banter on, on LinkedIn or whatever. And they're in they're off. They're now um, commercial pilots flying seven seven sevens on BA for BA, or they're yeah. in defence, yeah. you know, doing all that kind of thing. Uh, but there's still there's still that camaraderie there, and we 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 talk about that time that was nearly twenty years ago, and where it was it was their special time as well as my special time. And and actually, if I can go back to or fast forward to a fortunate woman, where I said to uh, the doctor, who um, I, I, I rode in her car to a, 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 an appointment, a, a home visit, where she visited an elderly gentleman. And it's in the book where she's bending down and she touches his hand because her doctoring 
technique yeah. is to is to touch and to feel, especially if there's masks involved. You know that the human touch cannot be replicated. And I and I said to her, I remember very clearly on one of our last journeys back to the surgery, I said, you know, this is our time. When we look back on whatever happens with this book, we know it's going to be published because there's a publishing deal. Mm-hmm. It will be printed, but when we speak to each other, hopefully in years and maybe decades to come. I hope that you and I are still friends, that we can see how this uh, partly changed our own lives. And I think that's a, a, a lovely thing where you can speak to your subject and empathize on a level where you both shared the same experience, but from different angles. She or the Red Arrows as the subject and me as an author or an artist to report on on a, on their story and she said a lovely thing uh, as well as they have you know um thank you for telling my story yeah. it's an, a remarkable thing she said uh, to have one's story told in such vivid detail not just in beautiful writing and the way polly has written about me but in the way that you've summed up my career uh, at the time i am in my career in in her late 40s and so that for me um makes it mm. so so worthwhile and 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 I think about that often it's not just about looking at the pages that are printed in the book and reading passages back through it and it, you know it all floods back to you and and you or you look at the book in a bookshop in waterstones and foils and and hatchards which I do while it's there because I can and and it it won't always be there mm. I go back to it and look at it and go Oh, that's that's a really special thing to do, regardless of what people think of it. Uh, and I know mm. perhaps some people in the photo community don't perhaps get it because all they do is flick through right way round, backwards. I don't care, mm. and they just look at the pictures and they go, "Perhaps the pictures are on text paper. They're not on fine glossy matte paper. Look at the repro." But I would say to them, "Don't judge me or them." on the basis of just flicking through. You need to read this and to understand what the pictures say in context with the writing. I'm slightly blue in the face because I've said it to so many people. Yeah. But I'm learning that because it's not a it's not a photography book, it's a book containing pictures. And I think that slight there's a lot of noses that have gone in the air and it's slight it's more than slightly irksome to me. Yeah. But you know what? I, I'm I'm getting past caring, so that's my message. We all read it different ways, and I think yeah, I think it's fine for a photographer to maybe skip to it because that's what they're looking at. But it's interesting how it, it's how it's passed on, and especially like to say we look at the, the John Moore pictures, how they were passed on to this contemporary piece. It was passed on to a new way of looking at stuff. This book's come out of that that process. And Nick Hedges did Summerhill in the 60s, and that was done in a sort of penguin-shaped book. It wasn't about the photographs where people might look at it and go, well, you know, like, is this a photography book or is this a, a book about education and children and stuff like that? What's interesting about The Red Arrows as well and this book is what and how it will be passed on in 20. 20- 30 years. And that's what's important, you know? I hope so. As the Red Arrows book as well, you know? Who's going to look at that in 20, 30 years' time and think, what can I do now? You made a point earlier that actually the Red Arrows deserved a book to be done. There have been loads of books done about them, but none like this where their story is told with uh, a little bit more empathy than... Exactly. So there's value in that. Absolutely. They are absolutely historic, little historical documents, and I and I and I don't try and uh, say that conceitedly because I think you have when you take on a project, any project, I think you have to look on how historical it should or might be because you know through experience that pictures date very very quickly. Don't we know it? Especially since two thousand and four, and and slightly behind that. No. Don't we know that haircuts, fashion? I mean. No. I've been photographing in the city of London for many, many years. Um, I first went there in the uh, – well, I did, I did a story actually about the city of London for the Sunday Express magazine for, for John Lythe again. It was, he said, I want a year in the life of the city of London. And it set me on a course that, that set me up for lots of different situations and piece of work that grew and grew and grew, way larger than the Express would use. But, uh, but it still sells that work today. 
importantly, yeah. there are still pictures of uh, outside the Bank of England. There, there is still a little stand where you can pick up your free copy of the Evening Standard. Back in 1992, which was the year of Black Monday, when the pound crashed against the dollar, was it? There was a man selling. You would buy the newspaper then. So for 10, 20, 30p or whatever it was, 50p, yeah. you would buy the Evening Standard. Every day, I would see the same old gentleman turn up in his pinstripe suit and his waistcoat and his bowler hat. He was, he was the man he was the father out of Mary Poppins, the father, who who would you know report to the old blokes in in the Bank of England and say you know, don't waste your penny on on yeah. feeding the birds you know invest it young man invest it. He was that gentleman. He was a man from a bygone age, and I realised he was even then he was a bit of a relic. You know he he was a rarity, and and I wouldn't see the likes of him again. After a few years, he disappeared. Of course, he disappeared because he looked as if he was in his nineties then. No. But but he would drag himself. I think I spoke to him one day, and he said, um, "Oh, I try and come up every day, but I, I have retired. But I like to keep my hand in. You know that lovely expression of, I like to I like to still do it. You know to keep myself young. No. Actually, that's that's the thing about photographers. We like to try and keep our hands in and, and stay young through our photography, and and, and that's quite important. No. The point is that there is no man in a pinstripe no. pinstripe suit anymore. There is no bowler hat. Yeah. The young men now, they don't wear socks. Their their trousers are too short, and, mm. and they wear blue suits, and they've got designer stubble. That's that's of its day. I photograph both, and I have them both in my collection and everything in between. That's really important. So whether it's Red Arrows or a country doctor, things are not going to stay the same. Um, the, 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 po the point about the country doctor, of course, the premise is about optimism and about doctoring. The fact is that we don't have enough general practice doctors out there practicing relationship-based uh, doctoring. It's a rarity, and there's not enough of it. Doctors have become numbers. Time is, their time is, is, um, is quantified in minutes, yeah, yeah. and it's not enough. Her way might be seen as nostalgic. We've tried yeah. to not make it that, but I know that the pictures I've taken of her and the way she looks, the way the surgery looks, will date very quickly. That's fine. I want that. Yeah. It's interesting when you're talking about how things change. And I was recently scanning legs from London from about 19, well, about 1998 and stuff like that. And I'm scanning them and thinking, it's just not going to work. <laughs> it just looks so dated. And I'm thinking, how am I going to sell that as stock now? You know, that one one off of somebody wanting a sort of shot from the 90s. My archive exists as as digital files on photo shelter, et cetera, as we've said before. Yeah. I still have four filing cabinets here full of originals. In fact, to be blunt, I have culled an awful lot over the years because my third and fourth rate pictures I see as being superfluous and I, I've ditched a lot. Yeah. And I know that some people out there go, what? Oh, I do as well. Mad? Are you mad? And I know a, a very special friend who lives up in Glasgow could not believe that I that I've done this. The point is, I had to because I'm running out of storage space. But I have kept mm. very very carefully everything else. I've kept my A edits and my B edits, and I've kept my my prime stories and projects and assignments that I've done in one single filing cabinet. They are sacrosanct. To, to go back through them. Even now, I, I, I traditionally it's horrible, went, isn't it? it? It is a task, and it gives you a neck ache, and you realise, you know, what you didn't enjoy about bending over a light box for days at a time, uh, because of you know the headaches it gave you. Uh, I do realise when I go back through that each time I've done so every year for the last 10, 12 years, every time I go and do another sweep, I find something new, and I find something new because no. what you've seen as not very interesting at the time. Yeah, of course. Then gets promoted up the list of being a little bit interesting. Well, that is quite interesting to that is very interesting now because of the way that we live our lives now through yeah. the internet or phones or or whatever. Yeah. I've covered many protests in Westminster, Brexit, um, climate change, XR, all those kind of things. And I purposely stayed clear of Downing Street because back in the old days I had um done a lot of a political work for people like uh, Time and Newsweek, either on assignment or or they used the pictures afterwards. 
people like Tom Stoddart and, and Keith Bernstein and David Medell and Zed and John Ridden, we'd all been there working for different people. So I'd been and done the Downing Street thing. And for all those years of going on to other things, other assignments and books and things, I, I had steered clear, well clear of, of um, Downing Street. But because oh, it was someone, some, someone said something to me on, on Instagram just before when, when the rumors were circulating that you know Boris was about to go, um, I thought I'd really like to be there to see him get in the car and drive down the lane again, just as Thatcher did. I thought that was quite enticing. Yeah. Although, as it turned out, um, he, he didn't. He just he stood at, the, at his podium and, and walked back inside again, which, which was actually quite an important picture as well because it yeah. described him not quite le- leaving, but not quite leaving. He was checking out, but not, yeah. like, not quite leaving, like in the Eagles. Uh, and so I found myself in Downing Street again. I showed my press pass and went through security and had my stuff x-rayed. I'd never done that before. But I ended up standing next to um, a really, really good photographer called Leon Neal, who's, who's a staff news photographer. Uh, Getty. And um, w- we had crossed paths over the last few months, and I'd got to slightly know him, but but hugely admiring of him. And he said, you know, I have never, that's he, I have never uh, shot a roll of film in anger on any job ever. And I said, what, never? And he said, no, when I did my press course at Sheffield, he said, um, we had, I had a nick on D something. And it suddenly dawned on me that you know, those of us who'd been working in the 90s and up to, well, certainly in my case, I last shot film properly uh, after The Red Arrows. The Red Arrows was the last project that I ever uh, used film for. Um, and I started using digital soon afterwards. Yeah. But, but thereafter, there, so there are, there are people working now at a very high level that have never used film. No. So in that respect, I feel slightly dinosaurish, but also blessed yes yes i am blessed i think we are blessed zach yeah um we are all blessed that we've experienced it because you know it's a bit like i mean we're pre-internet we're pre-phone we're pre-everything apart from the only the only thing we have in common now with with the new generation is that we look through a rectangle and point it at something we see as mildly interesting yeah thereafter everything's changed and and i had for the year or two years when i migrated to digital i had a huge problem getting my head around the fact that there wasn't something physical inside no. the little black box that i held to my eye and and i found that disconcerting and uncomfortable and worrying and i found i was quite anxious thereafter i had no idea what to do with the files I and mean, when i deleted the wrong versions i didn't know what my digital asset management was all about i i was i was i was um i was floundering slightly but bit bit by bit it came together but after learning a lot of from the mistakes i had made as i had made mistakes in exposing kodachrome and transparency film <laughs> you know <laughs> that we never quite managed to do properly um yeah. i i got through it and now i'm i'm you know Oh, so cameras, you did, you did ask about cameras, didn't you? Can we, did you want to touch on that? Let's go back to cameras, yes. So what was your first camera? Canon AT1, 169.99 from Queen's Road in Southend-on-Sea that I bought uh, with a, a paycheck from the airport. I paid for it because I realized that I, as a non-smoker, 169 pounds was worth several packets of fags. So I thought, if I'm not smoking, and I never have, I could put this to better use. So yeah. I did that. And it was probably what amateur photographers said that a beginning amateur should buy. And it was, yeah, it's a great little camera. 50 mil? Uh, ab- absolutely. Yeah, 50 mil. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wider, nothing longer. Yep. What was the film you were putting through it? Color Kodak. What would it have been at the time? I don't know. Wouldn't have been Portra. Too early for Portra. Kodakolor. Yeah, of course. It was Kodakolor. Kodakolor. Yeah, it was Kodakolor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holi- holiday snap film. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It's interesting listening to your stories about the Red Arrows. Who was paying for all of this? Oh, I paid for that myself. It's interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah. I d- totted up how much it cost me to do. It cost me, cost me about 10 grand, I think. Yeah. Having said that, what should have happened... <laughs> 
is that we had a loose arrangement uh, at Cats IPG for the if the if the agency, the powers that be, John Easterby, in fact, liked the idea of the uh, the the idea. If we didn't have a guarantee against page race, or we didn't get an assignment out of the idea. The agency would pay 50% of expenses. That's the way it usually works. So if I went mm. to Downing Street and shot four rolls of Fuji Chrome 100, no. they would pay 50% of the processing, my, the Metro processing fee. In fact, it was put on their account and they would bill me for 50% of the, yeah. of, of the, of the, uh, the cost. So as, as would they would with uh, flights or trains or buses or whatever, or food, if I went away somewhere for a week, I would bill them. I'd Prove to them how well I've crossed. So that's the way it would work. Yeah. When I was doing the Red Arrows project, that should have happened. That should have kicked in when I finished. And I totted up and gone, okay, Mr. Easterby, this is what it's cost me. It's cost me 10 grand. Pay me 5,000 pounds and I'll be very happy. And then, you know, we'll split the proceeds on what the book makes, on print sales, blah, 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 blah. There was no agency. I was on my own. I had to fork for the lot. As I had done so, but I, I'd got zero back. In fact, when the agency folded, there was a threat, and this was nothing to do with John. This was the powers that be that took over the the insolvency of the agency. Because mm. don't forget, we were owned by Hachette. That's right. Uh, they they closed us down. They are the ones that said on one Monday or Tuesday morning, said, "Do not answer the phones anymore." You are closed. Do not trade. Do nothing. Go home. And essentially, thereafter, the whole icon, the whole of Cat's Pictures archive, and thereafter was was dismantled piece by piece by students who were sat uh, at the at the cellar at the uh, the ex staff's desks, mm. finding pictures from hundreds and hundreds of contributors, stuffing them into plastic sleeves. And then, in, in theory, boxing them off and sending them back or having photographers come and get them. Yeah. What happened is that they were putting them in just plastic sleeves, turning them upside down. Lots of originals are falling between the floorboards yeah. where they remain to this day, I imagine. Wow. Not only that, but the people running the insolvency said the scans of your projects, like yours, Richard, Red Arrows, you don't own those. We own them. Mm, they were scanned on company time by company staff. Uh, and I had 700 scans of NEGS mm. that I put for, you know, they, they would scan them for me. So when I say that I was out of pocket, I was out of pocket 10,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds. But I had uh, a hard drive full of, or the computers full of my, a folder saying Richard Baker, Red Arrows, um, 700 of which were, were high res scans. Yeah. They then said, you can't have them. Nice. So, yeah, nice. So, what we did, or what I certainly did, and what many of us did, was go out and buy a new generation of hard drive that plugged in by USB from, what was it, from Flash Center or somewhere, yeah. and plugged them in um, uh, at lunchtime when the insolvency man left for lunch, plugged them in and dragged everything into the folder and walked out with my scans. And that's how I had the scans for the book. Otherwise, wow. I would have had to have scanned all my own work themselves, which would have cost me how many extra that's thousand that. pounds, you know, a huge amount because I didn't have an Imancon. I didn't have any Canon scanner. I don't know many people apart from one person who's got one of them. Hmm. David Levins has got one. Well, maybe I could have paid Levinson to do it, but he would have charged me, you know, the going rate. Of course, he would have. No, done. he didn't. <laughs> no, you know what? He did mine for free. He did about seven or eight. Of, well, only seven or eight. He did some for me for free. It was very kind of him. Did he? Oh well. well. The point was, Zach, it very nearly didn't happen. Yeah. That project very nearly didn't get published for all sorts of reasons. Least of all, I wouldn't have had my scans, but I had my eggs. But I didn't, you know, I didn't have an agency. Then I didn't have a publisher. Then I didn't have an agency, and it and it could have, they could all still remain on DVDs, just sitting behind me here in my office. That's where it could have could have ended up. As it happens, um, I negotiated a deal with the publisher to give me 750 books that I could give away to art directors and picture editors as little sweetness saying, I'm on my own here. I'm floundering. I need I need some yeah, jobs. Yeah. Will you take me on? Will you give me some work? Almost felt as if I was back from scratch, except I had a book. And I did so. 
in the summer of 2005, which you may remember, there was a series of explosions on the underground in London, including a bus and including the tube. I, at that time, was traveling into town with books laden in a big rucksack, all, all packaged up, all, um, all addressed and with personal notes and cards to advertising agency, uh, art buyers and picture editors, people who I thought would be able to buy into the product and give me some work and maybe allow me to do something similar. No. And people on the tubes and on the public transport gave me a really wide berth when I was getting on with this big rucksack. I mean, can you, can you imagine it? The paranoia yeah. and the nervousness at the time was, was quite remarkable. So it was, it was around that time that I was hawking around the book and I got absolutely nowhere. I, I got nothing out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and I, on, on one, whatever, one morning, I thought, I know the person I'll send it to. Let's try this person. Let's send it to a writer whose work I quite admired and I was intrigued by. And it was a, it was a philosopher, writer, and essayist called Alain de Botton. No. And I knew that he had uh, published a book called The Art of Travel. And in it, he confesses to be a, an aviation nut, but not a plane spotter. And that really struck a chord with me because I just thought, I wonder if he'd like to see these pictures. Who knows what would happen if he likes aeroplanes and, and the aesthetic of, of air travel, of airports, no. the culture of being a passenger and being an air traveler. Let's, let's just see if, it, if, if he likes it. And I sent him a copy to his, um, to his agent. And within two days, I got an email back from Alain de Botton who said, hello, really, really like your book. I've just spent two hours, in fact, an afternoon looking at your website. And I think this is really interesting work. I am writing a book. I'm just researching it at the moment. And would you be interested in collaborating with me? This idea of a book called, uh, well, it was, a, it was a book about the world of work, about logistics, about how products reach uh, our, uh, let, let, let's, let's pretend that we're doing a, a book about, a chapter about tuna fish. Let's, for example, say, I wonder how a tuna fish is caught in the Indian Ocean and how it ends up on our dinner plate on a Friday evening. Mm. Let's explore how things get to where they're supposed to do. Let's, let's imagine that we are traveling with the product and see how... The transportation to get there. The commodities of our daily lives are ending up where they need yeah. to be to be sold. What's capitalism all about? Yeah. Let's also see, let's see where pylons take electricity. Let's, let's imagine electricity flowing across the landscape and ending up from Dungeness, let's say, at the power station where it's generated to, let's say, the West End of London, where the consumers are burning the power to, to power neon lights. Let's do that kind of thing. Are you interested? The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work. And that became a book called The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work, which um, led on to another book straight away because he was asked on the strength of that book whether he would become an artist in residence uh, at um, Heathrow. And he said, yes, but I will only do it if we made joints. <laughs> I, can ask, I can ask Richard Baker to do the pictures. So he and I awesome. spent three weeks running around um, Terminal 5 at Heathrow, and we did a book that was sponsored by British Airports yeah. Authority, BAA, that doesn't exist anymore. And they said, well, we said, first of all, yeah, but what if, what if we see a cockroach running? Oh, this is a famous, this is a famous instance. What if we see a cockroach running under people's feet or there's a rat we see a rat can we write about it and they said yes but you're not going to see one (laughs) and we thought well let's go and find the rat or the cockroach let's let's just prove a point the point was they let us basically write little stories little vignettes little portraits of passengers and the people who work there and it became a little little it was a little um paperback book that they that we that was published by profile books became a, a, a success in that it was, you know, it was the archetypal airport book yeah. that was sold at airports to, for people, to, uh, as people yeah. to experience as passengers, stories of other passengers about air travel at yeah. and, and that period. And so as a result of that book, you know, it was, it was like leapfrogging, stepping stones from, from, pleasures and, from red arrows to pleasures and sorrows to Heathrow became an idea that that was published by Profile Books, the um, the Heathrow book, 
Profile Books then published wanted to publish a book in conjunction with this book for uh, Alliance uh, Insurance about risk, and that's how Polly uh, and I okay. were put together. So that's the full circle about how all these books have come into being, one by one. But had it not been for the Red Arrows, had it not been for the fact perhaps that I lifted those scans that allowed me to to make the book that then Alan saw that then bit by bit after several years that Polly was introduced to me. You know, the last book about a country doctor wouldn't have happened. So who knows circumstance by circumstance wouldn't have happened. Circumstance by circumstance, if had not your friend sat down to dinner with somebody who then thought he could do the Red Arrows, he could do something here. Yeah. That may or, never, or, your or, life may have been totally different. Or, 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 the, or the phone call that said, oh, someone's starting an agency. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to then piece together all that, those happenstances to then find out oh, what yeah. your path is. And you can only look at the path. You don't look at the path forward. You look at from up front looking oh, behind yeah. you, don't you? You can only then recognize how much utter perfect sense that makes. You know, it's interesting you say that. I, I don't know about you, but all the way through my working life as a photographer, every time somebody called me for a job, I would say 50-50 out of the blue. I used to I used to be astounded. By, I, I, I never got over the fact that people would ring me to go and shoot for them and, and want to pay me like money to go and take pictures. And they never even met me. And I was just... I never got over I that. I never got over that. Mm. And it, it always baffled me and astounded me mm. that yeah. sort of phone call of fate and how it takes you on another road and how it helps you pay your mortgage. It, it never never got over that. Mm. Back in the day, I I think our, our all our own philosophies were you never say no to anything. You or you say yes to everything. I kind of reverse that, you know. I, I, as I said in the beginning, I make no sense to myself because I turn things down. Why? Because a, I smell a rat, and I know I'm going to be screwed somehow. That's what I feel in my water. And like Kate Moss said on um, Desert Island Discs the other mm. day, you can smell a wrong one. You can sm- you can sniff out the ones that you should stay stay away from. But also. I've been there and done that, and 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 I I couldn't yeah. put the time and the effort as I would have done as a thirty year old. Now I'm in my sixties, and you need to pace yourself. The last thing I, I want to touch on is you know how paths cross. We met we mentioned paths crossing, and how when you take on a project, you don't understand quite what you're in for. And when someone says that I've got an idea and it's about healthcare and access is going to be difficult, but then you think. Yeah. Well, this is during a pandemic. How could mm. I say no? This is, of course, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm going to say yes, no matter what she says next to me. And you do, but then you still don't know what you're in for. And then the writer says, have you heard of, of a book that John Berger did about a country doctor? And you say, yes. And she says, oh, really? Yeah. And you go, yes, because someone mentioned it to me at college at Newport 30, 40 years ago. And of course, I've heard of it. And I've been thinking about that book ever since. Alain de Botton then mentioned it to me as maybe we should look at this as a way of collaborating on this next book. To then say uh, to, to this current client, uh, a, a collaborator of mine, or as John Berger might say, accomplice, because he, he used to call Jean Moore an accomplice. So Polly hasn't heard of the book, but I have. And then when Polly, the writer, says to the doctor, I don't suppose you've heard of a book by John Berger that was about a country doctor in 1967. And the doctor says, it's why I became a doctor. I know that book. And I've read it four times. Wow. Once, twice, two, three times when I was a teenager, when I was 14. Wow. Once when I finally thought I might want to study medicine. And then by accident, she then discovers, after she's become a doctor and she's accepted a new post in a country practice, she then realizes that the book, is it exactly the same practice, the same landscape as she's been into? Wow. That's when you think yeah. the threads are all, the, the, the stars are aligning here. The stars say this was meant yeah, to be. Totally. That's when you realize you've got something special on your hands. And to be honest, that's not where the coincidences stop. They go on and on and on. You think this is really cosmic. It is. It is. 
and, and that's when you think, I should have said, I'm glad I said yes to this because this was meant to be. So all these circumstances, all these little Venn diagram circles, all converging, you think, I've taken some right decisions and I'm probably taking some bad ones, but you don't remember those, do you? You just remember the good ones. Well, going full circle, we actually worked together on UK at Home in 2008. Oh, yes. Oh, that was lovely, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. That was a nice, that was the freedom. That was, it was a nice free job. Free, the freedom of the shoot was, was... What did you do on it? I did, um, I got, a, I think I had three pictures in. I did, because I'd come off the back of my Birdman, I did a colour picture of a guy holding a, a wing pigeon, a, a sort of a pigeon with its wings flapping in the windows. I did some people eating fish and chips in Oxfordshire, and I did a mother and a son in Newcastle. Oh, no, I had four in. I had um, some woman mowing the lawn, and the, 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 the husband had his feet up reading the paper, and she was mowing the lawn around. I've got a few in there. What did you have in? I'll look them up afterwards. I have it on my shelf. Of course you do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I did. I went mad. I said to John, give me everything. I've always wanted to do one of these books, and so – so he said, well, come up some ideas, but also we'll feed through lots of things. I, went, I ended up in Scotland. I ended up um, in the Isle of Skye. I went, I went down in a submarine. I went, I, went to a, I went to the peace camp. Then I went to visit a, a hermit that lives in a, in a, in a stone shack on the, the Isle of Skye. I went round the Isle of Skye, did loads of things. Um, I just, yeah, loads of things. It was great. It was great, great couple of weeks. Really, really enjoyed that. Were you at the party then? Probably. The exhibition launch party? Don't remember much about it, but yeah, I imagine it was. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah I'm sure I was. Amazing. No, I can't remember much about it as well. Um, <laughs> it was a good party. Thank you for, for your time and listening to you, your stories and your connection with photography in your life. There's one little question in my head. When you said you were shooting your Mamiya in the cockpit of the um, plane, you said you had 20 f- frames. Were you on 660 full on then? Ah, oh, No. No, it would have been less than 20, wouldn't it? Because six, seven on two. Yeah, no, so I shot 220. Yes, I shot 220. 220, that's what I mean. Yes. Where did I get 660 from? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it wasn't 120. It was 220. It was double, it was double length. Six. Yes, 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 yes. So, so the, the issue is that you've got so much more film yeah. wound onto the spiral. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That actually it's very tight. So winding it on is, uh, you've got to be really careful because otherwise it could snap. And not only snap, but if you know the, the way that those Mamiya's work, yeah. there's a lot of tension really? in the winder that winds through by the gears into the, yeah. um, the sprockets and the sprocket. So it can tear. So I didn't want that. So every time I shot a picture, I had to wind on really carefully, knowing that I was going around a tight bend or something. So it wasn't just about the number of frames that was not very many, but it was also about potentially mm. breaking the film in the camera. Yeah. That was one of the re- – <laughs> That was one- How stupid is no, that? that? How stupid? The, 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 I had a Mamiya 7 and, and I won it actually, but I sold it. I just couldn't use I can't use range finders. And um, that little sprocket underneath, that little pop-out winder is plastic. And if you break that, yeah. you cream crack it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I broke, I broke it, and I've had, and I've just had to order because oh. I'm thinking of selling them. I've ordered one that's made specially in Italy by a bloke. And that's the car. I give you that contact. Did you? Yeah. Remember, we had that long phone call. And I was, was telling it you, about, you? Oh. it was me about the brand. Oh, right. And, yeah, found, yeah, yeah. Okay. and you found him on Flickr, and that's how I found him. And he sure. still makes these little. If anybody yeah, wants. For but 30 euros, got... he makes it and sends it yeah. to you. And I got someone in uh, Shoreditch to fit it for me. Oh, amazing. And... It, but, but unfortunately, because I thought that was the only thing wrong with it, the uh, the focusing mechanism is knocked out of alignment. It's going to cost hundreds and hundreds to get it fixed. And I'm just Ooh. thinking it's not worth it. I know. I know a great man in Maidstone, uh. old school film guy. He served, he, he's amazing. You should. I'll, I'll give you his contact. Please. Up. Anyway, I'm a May 7, there's a little winder which pops out this is for anybody listening doesn't know what we're talking about there's a little winder at the bottom which turns out when you're rolling the foam in and it's a plastic it's a design fault if you've got a mamea 7 and you want to and it's broken we know a man who makes brass ones we do there you go listen Mm. man it's been a real joy and i think um you know this is going to be a two-part oh is it oh god (laughs) 
<laughs> well, good luck to anyone that wants to listen to me for, for two parts. I know there was lots of questions in my head I wanted to ask you. Oh, and, um, there was lots of things we, I wanted to say that no, I probably not said. But I know. I we well, we'll come back another, let's, let's come back. Let's come back on another right, day. Okay. Let's come right. back another day. Thank you very much, Zach. Oh, it's been great fun. It's been wonderful. And um, thank you. Enjoy your next book project. I'll let you know. <laughs> All the best, mate. Take care. Cheerio. Take care. Bye. Bye.